Hello. Um, we're back with another one. Liars Club. I uh, hope you're having a good day. It is cloudy here, but the snow is making everything pretty bright. So, um, I hope that the lighting doesn't have that weird glow thing that I was talking about a couple videos back. Um, anywho, let's start with chapter 11. We're on page 212, starting fresh with chapter 11. Our headlights streaked across a billboard announcing that we'd crossed into Antelope proper. The town fathers hoped to catch the ski crowd who drove straight past that sign, painted in chubby red cursive like you saw on ice cream trucks, to tell a ride up the road. Antelope was founded during the gold rush, though very few nuggets of gold got sifted through the screen mesh of many miners' pans back then. Somebody did pick axe up great streaks of silver and copper, but after those mines played out, Antelope had no clear means of keeping its citizens alive. Lisa was slumped on my shoulder, and I elbowed her, elbowed her, elbowed her to scope the place with me. Mother had geared us up all our lives for a great city. The bedtime stories she told were full of such places. Athens in the age of Socrates before the cynics started running things and folks got to open up their wrists long wise in the baths. And Paris of the twenties, Vienna, when a sick and sweaty Mozart was scribbling out the notes to his own requiem. Not least on that list was mother's own New York in the forties. Such a city was our birthright, we'd been told. But when we eased along Antelope's main street that wet fall night, squatty buildings and storefronts were lit only by a few beer signs. No marquees blinked. No long awnings were guarded by officious doormen with gold taxi whistles round their necks. By daylight, the landscape was capital B beautiful. By something grim and gothic, but something grim and gothic hung around the place. The mountains seemed to lurch over the town. Plus that that fall, the gray, the sky stayed gray, not unlike the skies I'd read about in Dracula, vaulted over by the Carpathian Mountains with their bare trees clawing out. I had founded a vampire club at the time, myself the only member. I wrote out the initiation ceremony, which was lengthy and painful, in my big red chief tablet. You started by poking your fingers with a straight pin to swap blood with all the other members. With Lisa watching, I jabbed both my own index fingers to prove how serious I was about the whole deal. You were also supposed to douse your hand in lighter fluid and set a match to it after patting it out fast on a wet towel, a trick I'd seen back in Leechfield on Halloween. This I postponed actually trying till there were a few more members to, to wow with it. Then came the written vampire test. You had to spell out the three or four Transylvanian words from the Bram Stoker book. Vlakoslak was the one I think meant vampire. That's spelled V-L-K-O-L-A-K. No, no. V-L-K-O-S-L-A-K. Vlakoslak. These would serve as passwords to enter the clubhouse. I never got around to cobbling together. Once you'd passed these trials, you got to mark your carotid arter carotid artery with two red dots from a laundry marker. Lisa refused to endure this, even when I offered to waive the initiation rights and promised she could be my vice president, then president, with myself as Igor. But truly, Antelope suggested such things, secret clubs, demonic rituals. The... German market still hung sausage by twine from the ceiling. The first time I pushed open the heavy door that set the huge cowboy banging overhead banging, I was horrified to look up and find all those fragrant inner chunks of meat in blood-colored casings swaying over me. It's like I've got the sausages hanging from the ceiling. They reminded me of some medieval etching I had seen in one of Mother's art books. Dozens of heretics hung by the Spanish spanish inquisition the bodies had swung off this giant scaffolding in some town square and just twirled rotting in the breeze arms falling off eyeballs popping out the guy who owned that market was named olaf no less he ran the place with his twin sister anna 
They were both about 100 years old. Their arthritic spines seeming to curve them more deeply in on themselves every time he went in. Each cast a shadow like a bulbous question mark on the scuffed and streaked linoleum. They scooped penny candy from drugstore jars and gave out samples of their own garlic cheese bread, which was a day-glow orange you never came across in nature. There was stuff on the shelves that had been sitting there since Eisenhower. The cans of bathroom cleaner they sold had faced the sun in their display pyramid for so long that their front labels had faded from lime green to pale yellow. Pla pale lemon. So they're still going on that citrus thing there. The mouse print instructions about not eating the stuff could no longer be read. If swallowed, each the cans said. Then there was just a wordless scorch mark as warning. <laughs> if swallowed, scorch mark. At first, we stayed across the street from the market in an old stucco resort hotel painted a stale pink. For breakfast and lunch, Anna slapped together, slapped together sandwiches from greasy salami and ham with white rivers of fat and grizzle running through it. They were huge dagwood sandwiches. She spiked them together with flat toothpicks. You had to disassemble one entirely for even the smallest bite. Then, the white bread itself was so tough and dry, I needed the better part of grape soda to wash down a mouthful. After a while, I skipped the bread entirely and lived on papery salami slices and leaves of iceberg lettuce sopped in mayo. I picked this stuff off other people's sandwiches along with big mealy tomato rounds. That caused Lisa to swap my hand a lot and say I was fixing to draw back a bloody stump. Nights, we ate in the town's one steakhouse, a damp, ill-lit place specializing in sprawling slabs of prime rib. There were martinis, or Gibsons, plural, to start, burgundy with dinner, and finally a cognac that mother likened to silky fire going down. Walking across the main street after one such meal, I watched the streetlight bob in the wind blowing down off the peaks. What a godforsaken country, I thought. Mother leaned on Lisa and Hector on me to cross. The sole driver, whose headlights slid off my face, must have taken Ector lur lurching across the road like Frankenstein for my daddy, which made me want to tape, tap on his windshield and explain things. Back at the hotel, they passed out, and Lisa nagged me to brush my teeth. You don't want those scummy green teeth like Ray back at the stable, she said. And I said, no ma'am, I didn't. In the mirror, I saw the wooden button from Ictor's pea coat had pressed a half-moon dimple into one cheek where he'd been leaning on me. I'd always wanted cheek dimples like Shirley Temple. Lisa spent some time trying to fix a matching one on the other cheek. First, she pinched with her thumbnail till I squealed. Then she pressed the toothpaste lid in the flesh while I counted to a hundred. But we never got the marks lined up right. Mother rented... A colonial house turned out in chintz and claw-footed mahogany. It belonged to the town's last bank president, who'd gone to jail, if I remember right, for embezzlement. Lisa and I had been in a, never been in a two-story house before. We walked through it, whispering, craning up at the high ceilings, the long drapes tied back with silk tassels. We curtsied to each other before sitting stiff-backed on the very edge of the rose love seat to pour, to pour fake tea. The house had scope. The dining table was long and dusty enough for us to write our names on, with room left over. I pointed out that the twelve matching chairs were like for the Last Supper, minus Jesus. They were deep as dentist chairs, with padded bottoms in royal blue satin. Comedy masks grinned down from the carved corner moldings. In the living room, a baby grand piano sat under a chandelier whose glass teardrops had gone a dull amber. French doors led from there to a small parlor where Hector and Mother set up their bed so we'd be less likely to pad in. Upstairs, Lisa and I had our own bedrooms for the first time. Mine had a tall cherry high boy with drawers deep as culverts, so even the clothes Mother ordered from Denver seemed paltry once. Seemed paltry once I had wadded them up in there. Lying next to it at night, I always expected one of the drawers to slide open in some midget corpse to, to sit up. So I got in the habit of crawling in with Lisa. 
She stayed asleep even if I was bold enough to weave my fingers in with hers. The first day of school, we walked till we reached a stretch of black graffiti on the sidewalk. Somebody named Ken blew dead bears, it said. Behind this sentence stood Antelope High, a building of gray cinder block that was the town's only school serving all grades. You had to walk past a gaggle of high school kids smoking to get up the steps. Boys had carved their hair into large judah rolls. The girls wore cats, eyeliner, and beehives. You could smell the air... What year is this? 1963. Um, you could smell the hair oil and peroxide ten feet away. In Leechfield, the older boys had been crew cut. Most had worn button-down shirts and cardigans like the teenagers on TV, except for a few farm kids who showed up in clean overalls and brogans. These Colorado kids seemed older somehow. The girls smoked right in public instead of hiding in the bathroom or behind the skating rink like they had back home. Somebody's transistor radio hidden in pocket or handbag was playing what sounded like Louie Louie, a black haired girl with unbelievably precise ebony split curls on both her pale cheeks was doing the dirty dog to this song right in front of everybody. She humped the air and held her white frosted lips pooched out. I'd only seen that dance done in Texas at a slumber par party by somebody's wicked cousin from Louisiana. I moved past her all slack jawed, for I judged that dance the moral equivalent of a strip show. We walked up wax entry stairs to a wall covered with brass hooks screwed floor to ceiling at exact intervals. Sleds were stacked off to one side next to low shelves for boots. For the first time, I realized I'd get to see snow there. There'd be snowballs and lumpy snowmen and sledding like I'd only seen in books. I resolved to fatten up, maybe even get some weight on, which was, I don't know if you can, weight on, where is it on the hand? So it's kind of like a phrase they've made up. Which was what Junior Dillard's brother had ordered from a back of a comic book to beef up for football. Oh, maybe it's some sort of supplement. He later complained that it turned his teeth gray, which, but I was sick of shopping for baby clothes when a vast circular, ra when vast circular racks of dresses marked chubbies got picked over by the bigger, bigger girls. Gray teeth or no, I wanted to make more of myself. So she's skinny mini and wants to wear the chubbies clothes, I guess. Lisa tipped my face up with a finger under my chin. She said if I got in a nickel's worth of trouble that day, she'd snatch me bald-headed after school. Then she glanced around to me, sure nobody saw before smashing my, my arms against my side in what was supposed to be a hug. She went clicking off in her new patent leather shoes. She needn't have bothered threatening me, for there were no teachers around to get in trouble with. School had taken up something called self-paced learning, which meant kids worked independently through a progression of reading folders and math folders. Student monitors oversaw the classes. The teachers stayed in the lounge all day smoking and eating from big Tupperware containers they took turns bringing in, brownies and cupcakes and cookies by the boatload. I was put in the fourth grade, but though I could at this instant rattle off my second and third grade seating charts without missing anybody, I couldn't name more than a kid or two from that class. The teacher did show up that first day to lead us through the pledge and take attendance. I can still feel the cool weight of her hand, which smelled faintly of Jergens, on my shoulder when she introduced me to the class. At my old school, a new kid would have had instant celebrity merely for being from somewhere else. Texan kids would have blitzed her, blitzed her, blitzed, yeah, blitzed her with airplane notes and swarmed over her at recess. These Western kids were more wary. I stood in front of the teacher watching them. Their faces looked back at me at me blank as dinner plates. By recess, nobody but the classroom monitor, who happened to be the principal's daughter, a blue-eyed girl with shiny Dutch boy hair cut the color of brass, could have told you my first name, much less where I'd come from. Also in Texas, a whole wad of fourth graders left unattended for long periods would have upended desks, scrawled nasty words on the board, lit fires in the trash cans. A scapegoat would have been chosen and picked on. Still, that teacher went sliding up the hall away from us with no more than a backward glance. In Antelope, even the dumb kids stayed immobile at their desk for the better part of the day, as if everybody had been given some powerful narcotic. 
These kids were pacey faced and indistinct. No one talked since you got demerits from the monitor. Too many demerits, you got detention, which came in 15 minute increments and meant staying even longer in the vacuum of that classroom while the red second hands circling the huge industrial clock face swept away the daylight hours. Hmm. Near the top of 218. Most kids bent their heads onto their notebooks and tried to sleep. One boy gauged the quality of his day by sleeping on graph paper, then drawing a circle around the drool spot he'd made, comparing it for size and integrity to his drool spot from the day before. For a while, I went through the reading and math folders to pass time. It was a stupid system where you moved from one level to the next wholly unsupervised. You even got to grade the test you'd given yourself. The monitor handed out the answer key and a red pencil stub for Xing mistakes. As far as I know, nobody ever even checked over my work. But I wouldn't have bothered cheating, for the tests were first grade easy. One I remember went something like this. Apples come in different colors. Color the apples in the tallest green tree. Color the apples in the next tallest tree red. Color the apples in the shortest tree yellow. How many apples are green? How many apples are red? How many apples are yellow? Even I could figure out that you didn't need to color them in first before counting them. The lesson seemed full of chores like that you could skip. Passing the test for one folder just led to another folder, and so on, into what seemed like an eternity of folders. There were trains traveling at 60 miles per hour toward Cincinnati. There were 12 stocks in each bundle of corn Farmer Brown was selling. The teacher can't have actually stayed in the lounge the whole day, of course, but that's what I recall. Once some boy stuck a paperclip up his nose and started a great gushing nosebleed. The demerits monitor, monitor tended to it. She tipped his head back and balled up his own gym sock over his nostril, an act that brought a brief scurry of oohs from the other kids because the sock was supposed to be frank. I was selected to fetch Miss So-and-so from the teacher's lounge. That involved navigating some concrete stairs down into the boiler room, which was like those horror movie basements that always got you screaming to the girl in the movie holding the candle. Don't go down! The furnace clanked when I passed it. The twisty pipes overhead were bound here and there with rags and still dripped sweat. Beyond all that stood the lounge door with... Beyond all that stood the lounge door with a round frosted glass window like you'd expect to find on a submarine. I put my hand on the brass knob and pulled. Inside the place was solid smoke. All the teachers at that time were women and stout women at that. Their broad backs faced me, their zippers straining to hold them inside their pastel dresses. Their enormous bottoms spilled over their wooden chairs on both sides. When their faces turned my way, I could see that each lady teacher had an aluminum ashtray all her own. Each had an empty paper plate with a white plastic fork that had been licked clean. And in the table center sat the remains of a gargantuan chocolate sheet cake. The piece of baker's cardboard it had been squatting on resembled a big muddy football field torn up by cleat marks or claw marks. My teacher got to her feet when she saw me and walked me back to the classroom. I moved 18 reading levels and 12 math levels the first week. A new school record achieved as much from boredom as ambition. They announced it on the loudspeaker one day after the pledge. I briefly felt that old surge of pride in my chest, but looking around, I caught a lot of eye rolling from the other kids. Maybe there was some secret class pledge about not achieving overmuch so as to not up the ante for the other kids. At recess that day, a sixth grade girl, everybody called Big Bertha behind her back, strode right up to me where I stood in line for the water fountain and slapped my face. She'd drawn back good before hitting me. So I saw the hand swinging at me from a ways off. But the oddness of it kept me so much... Kept me from so much as ducking. Once she'd whacked me, it took another second to sink in. I stood there holding my cheek. If I'd been more ready for the blow, I might have fallen down just for dramatic effect. My cheek finally started stinging under my hand. Meanwhile, the water fountain line dismantled itself. The kids of varying heights gathered on one side of us in a jagged wall to block us from the teacher's view. Big Bertha's little pig eyes squinched together with the rest of her features in the center of a vast moon pie face. 
She eventually let on that she'd hit me for making her little sister look dumb in my class. I didn't even know who her sister was, but I couldn't resist such a clear shot. So I said her sister didn't need any help in the looking dumb department, nor did Big Bertha herself, cow that she was. Hearing her nickname spoken right to her face, she backhanded my other cheek. This time, I flew into her big body, kicking and flailing. Lisa was at the far end of the playground, swinging at the time. She later told me that it looked like a windmill had broke loose from its stock and hurled right into the soft middle of old Bertha. She was slow, but eventually started landing some good blows upside my head. I was ready to quit when out of some wild instinct, my hands shot up to grab the collar of her blouse. I yanked down hard and through some miracle, every single white button on that blouse popped loose and fell with whispery little plops into the grass. At the, at the time, Bertha had both her hands dug in my hair, so the rubber bands from my pigtails tore at my scalp. My eyes were slanting up to my ears. My mouth felt like one of those astronaut training pictures in life where the wind pressure blo blows his mouth open to show his wisdom teeth. Bertha was so busy shaking my skull that it took her a minute to look down. When she did, she saw that her white training bra stretched over her poochy nipples was laid bare to the whole school, at which point she let me drop and bolted toward the cafeteria doors. The upshot of that fight was my right eye going black, the result of her boyfriend's chunky high school ring glancing off my face. Mother sent one of her barfly slaves over to the market for a T-bone to press on it and take the swelling out. When she patted foundation around my orbital bone and dusted the whole mess with talcum from her fluffiest brush. Oh, that's the end of the sentence. Then she patted foundation on my orbital bone and dusted the whole mess with talcum from her fluffiest brush. Yeah. Dieter, the bartender, was polishing the lipstick smudge off a beer mug with what seemed serious thought. Behind him, the bottles staggered up on their little choir risers, amber and green and clear bottles, and one bottle of luminous yellow chartreuse shining out of the back line like some brand of rocket fuel. I looked across the bar and caught in the mirror on the back wall a long view of my pudgy eye, misshapen and caked with powder. Daddy would have been proud of that eye, I thought, and slid off the stool. In the unheated bathroom, you could actually see your breath. I wiped mother's makeup off with a glob of toilet paper I had wetted down using tap water. Then I used the hand dryer to fix, fixed to the wall to blow my face dry, as much to warm up as anything. Standing there by myself with my eyes closed and that hot wind huffing down my features so I could feel my hair stream behind me and some blood start seeping back into my bunged up eye, I had a sudden flood of homesickness. Once I'd ridden in the back of daddy's truck all the way from the beach, sun that day had made even the nail heads on the floor of his truck truck bed hot enough to scald your bare foot if you set down on one set it down on one the back of daddy's head in his lone star cap had been fixed like an icon in the rear window i turned from him to lean my face up to the sun the wind itself was hot but somehow kept me from sweating awful much still that night i had a blistering sunburn on my face which daddy patted cool with noxzema the memory clicked off with the dryer as if the power on it got cut too. I hoisted myself up the sink's edge to check out that bruise again, using the rectangular mirror on the towel dispenser. The eye had swollen back up glossy blue-black with a streak of green at the edge. Daddy would have called it a kick-ass shiner. Later, when I laid half-dozing on the banquet in... Yeah, banquet, I guess. In the bar's darkest corner, I could almost see Daddy taking form from the vast ether of alcohol fumes and smoke. Finally, he sat next to me, or a ghost of him sat, for I wasn't crazy enough to have believed that the Daddy shape I'd conjured was actual. I knew full well he wasn't. Still, it comforted me to see him assemble through the veil of my own lashes. He sat gangly inside his creased khakis. You gotta keep your guard up, he finally said. He drew a smoke from the tight line of camels, camels lined up like organ pipes. The glass on the black tabletop was only a little more transparent than he was. I told him I was missing him awful, 
but he just shrugged that off. And lead with your left. Then she can't reach that eye. Let me see that. His thumb pad pressed around the bruise, testing it for tenderness. Hell, you'll be all right. My eyes burned. I wanted to rest a minute with only Daddy keeping me suspended in the world. The way his big, wide palms had when I'd learned to back float at the town pool. That's how, it, how I felt listening, buoyed up in my own tiredness by Daddy's presence. I fell dead asleep, lying in his ghost lap. Moving too fast through the folders had one other side effect even worse than Big Bertha clocking me. The principal wanted to talk to Mother about my skipping another grade. The principal's name was Mr. Janish, and other than the fact that the kids called him Janbo, I remember not one distinct, distinct feature of his. He was a looming blur in a blue, light blue three-button suit and striped tie. Mother flounced toward him, holding out her hand. She wore her sheer beaver, sheared beaver coat. Gordon escorted her in. He was one of the barflies she paid in drinks to drive us to and from what she called the three poles of our being, school, bar, home. He steered her by the elbow from Mr. Janish's desk to the brown. This must be a, some sort of brand of chair. Naga hide, armchair in the corner. Gordon's being there embarrassed me. He had white girly hands. His skin was a mass of acne pits and scarring. Some poet once wrote about the young man carbuncular, and that was Gordon. That day, he wore rumpled camouflage fatigues with black combat boots. Mr. Janish asked about Gordon's branch of military service. Old Gordon just ducked his head in fake modesty and lied through his beaver-like front teeth that he was a matter of national security. That that was a matter of national security. I knew for a stone fact that Gordon had been 4F during Korea for something being flat-footed or somehow nutty. Gordon's whole military act was made extra pathetic by the fact that he had a big soft ass like a woman's. He tried to hide this by wearing his shirt pulled out. But that was the equivalent of wearing an I have a fat butt sh of wearing an I have a fat butt sign. <laughs> In short, he was pompous and soft at once, and even having mother explain that he was our chauffeur made me wince. No sooner was mother seated than Gordon lit her cigarette with a butane lighter that sent up a flame about a foot high. He pocketed the lighter, then leaned his butt against the window ledge and opened a magazine he'd brought along, the cover of which showed a cartoon Nazi, skinny and with long, a long ferret-like nose, squinting his eye to hold a monocle in place. This Nazi was pinning back the arms of a large-breasted blonde dressed in a shredded nurse outfit. The intensity Gordon brought to studying this magazine made me feel even worse than the fact that Mr. Janish could see the sleazy cover. I guess I concentrated so hard on Gordon that day because I almost couldn't bear to look at Mother. She'd become the picture of somebody nuts. For one thing, she'd tried to dye her hair red that fall, but wound up with a substance less hair than pelt. It was the overall color and texture of dried alfalfa. For another, she hadn't bothered actually dressing for the meeting. She just stepped bare-legged in her cowboy boots, smushed some muddy lipstick on her mouth, and thrown that fur coat on over her peach silk nightgown. But she scalp but the scalped hem of of the gown kept peeking out her coat bottom whenever she crossed her legs, and it seemed to me she crossed her legs a lot that morning. Maybe she was trying to show her legs off to old Jan Janbo, a man on whom good legs might well have been lost. He just rocked back and forth in his office chair, nodding politely over the vast green expanse of his desk blotter. Top of 224. Less than 100 pages to go here. I tried to keep a stiff smile welded on my face the whole time, even when Mother invited him and his wife down to the bar for drinks on the house any afternoon. She called the Longhorn a family place. She bragged that her own brilliant daughters she smoothed my hair at this point, sat studying at a cocktail table while the jukebox played classical music. I distinctly recall ducking my head out from under her hand. Something about the small betrayal of moving away from her still gives me a stab of guilt. 
I knew that old Janbo knew that the Longhorn was a sleazeball dive, and I didn't want to sully myself any worse by seeming to back up such an obvious lie. Lisa and I did go to the bar after school, but instead of homework, we played this electric game, a mix of shuffleboard and bowling, where you slid a hockey puck down a long glassy lane to whack up some bowling pins. Or else we sat at the bar sipping cherry cokes and learning bar tricks. I knew how to build a house of playing cards and could throw dice from a cup so they came up nothing but sevens. I could also follow the slick moves of a shell game. I was too clumsy to execute them myself. Or fold a bar towel so it resembled a huge erect horse penis that would sell, set all the customers laughing themselves into a blended chorus of drunk donkey snorts. The only classical piece on the jukebox was Ravel's Bolero, unless you counted the music from Exodus, which made the Irish bartender weep. Mother carried a screwdriver around in her purse to jack the volume, like an actual tool screwdriver this time, in her purse to jack the volume of that box up or down depending on her mood and whenever she and whether she felt like dancing. Mostly we listened to Tennessee Ernie Ford singing about mining 16, 16 tons of coal or following the wild geese in his with his heart. Weird. Certain steady customers hadn't moved for so long there were practically cobwebs sti stitching them to their bar stools. I'd seen the paintings of Edward Hopper, the washed out misery of people slumped in diners. Mother had a book of them, one portrait more gray faced than the next. The Longhorn was broke out in that kind of person. Gordon and Joey were the most animate regulars, being young enough to run errands for Mother when her headaches were too blinding for her to get behind a steering wheel. Joey survived on disability. He picked up a monthly check from some lawyer in Colorado Springs for the back black lung he'd contracted mining, which didn't keep him from sucking down cigarettes all day and night. The index fingers on both his hands had brownish stains from nicotine. Unlike Gordon, Joey had once been handsome. He was a Mexican Indian, small but broad-chested and narrow-hipped. He had a square jaw and black eyes Mother liked to call soulful. Those eyes had saggy pouches under them, though... Saggy punches under them, though. Pouches. Ugh. And his straight black lashes stayed at half-mast all the time. The result of codeine, painkillers, and Valium, which Mother had also asked his doctor to prescribe for her. Plus, the coughing fits he went into several times a day lasted a good five or ten minutes and stopped any bar conversation dead. He was clearly fixing to blow long. I patted Joey on the back when he coughed, like he only had a fishbone stuck in his throat, asking, did it go down the wrong pipe? While Lisa fetched him a glass of water from behind the bar. She could be very patient, Lisa, holding out a frosted Collins glass while Joey wheezed. He always left a pile of cocktail napkins he'd coughed into. Once after last call, I'd unfolded one and a buck found a buckshot found a buckshot pattern of blood speckles that made me drop it to the floor like it was radioactive before Dieter swept it up with swizzle sticks. Gordon was sturdier looking. He lived with his mother on the edge of town and had a pasture Wait, wasn't Gordon the one who brought them in to the place? Yeah, it was. Okay. Gordon was sturdier looking. He lived with his mother on the edge of town and had a pasture where he boarded our horses. What do you do for a living anyways? I asked Gordon one afternoon. At the time, he was trying to teach me how to flip a filbert nut on the back of my hand and straight into my mouth. Business interest, Gordon said. That caused Joey to laugh his way into a hacking fit. It's a smoker's cough, yeah. I was patting on his bony back when Mother pulled me into the bathroom to explain it wasn't nice to ask what people did. That was the opposite from what I'd learned in Texas, where a job was a person's lowest common denominator, maybe even more defining than sex. You know people based on what plant they clocked in at, which union at that plant, and what union took their dues money. Pipe fitters, teamsters, or the OCAW. In the morning, when I'd pad downstairs in my socks, I always found either Joey or Gordon passed out on the sofa, on the parlor sofa. My task was to wake one and send him shivering out to warm up in the car before driving us to school. We could have walked, of course, but Mother fancied our being driven. 
I made a habit of setting the gas flame under the kettle for coffee before I even poured myself cereal. That was meanness on my part, since the shrill whistle of that kettle woke any sleeper within range to a wincing misery. One bright, cool Sunday, Mother sent them both to Gordon's pasture with us to catch our horses. We'd, we'd been begging for that since we'd hit antelope. I tore my hair in numerous tantrums over it. What finally inspired Mother about the project was some rodeo rider who dropped in the bar one Saturday night trying to sell a pair of show bridles. He was on his way to Wyoming and needed extra cash so he could ask his girl to marry him. He flipped open his hand-tooled billfold to show us her homecoming queen picture in its scratched-up vinyl window. She was wearing a rhinestone tiara in her blonde, blonde flipped-up hair and smiling out at us with more straight white teeth than I'd ever seen in a human mouth. One look at her and at this cowboy's sorry mooning face and mother bought drinks all around. Then she'd rung open the cash register for a stack of bills and gone outside to buy those bridles right from his truck, truck bed. Joey and Gordon drove us to the pa pasture the next day right after dawn. There was a hard frost on the ground when we set out across the field. The sky was dark blue. The horses stood feeding at some unbound hay bales near a ragged shed. I suddenly remembered the sleek power of being high on Big Enough's back, how I'd steered him around the barrel in that gymkhana, almost lithe for once, dipping out of the saddle to grab the flag from the sand bucket in a single balletic swoop that saved me seconds and won me the red ribbon. It took all the restraint I had that cold morning. I was not given to restraint, not to bolt at him. I moved easy. I started the low clicking noise Daddy had taught me to stop a squirrel on a branch. The horse had seen me right off course. The minute I'd slid under the barbed wire, he stopped tearing at the straw. He lifted his long neck and pricked his black ears toward us. He nickered, which, which I read was a nod of greeting. Then, sure enough, stopped eating and high stepped a few yards away watching. We must have made a sorry procession, Lisa and I, clanging the bridles, the long reins dragging on the frosted ground behind us. Joey and Gordon, in their thin trench coats and scuffed up dress shoes, both stinking of old drink. Still, I actually believed that those horses would gallop toward us, the way National Velvet had toward young Liz Taylor. But the alert look in Big Enough's round, dark eyes was not, in fact, joy at my return. It was dread. He had gone green as a colt. His expression was some, some equine way of saying, not her again. Eventually, Gordon and Joey took off after both horses. They got sick of how patiently Lisa and I held out handfuls of stiff grass, waiting for them to trot over. But the men didn't know horses. The bridles looked odd in their hands. Gordon squatted down to my eye level and drew his assault plan on his palm like a football captain. Lisa and I were supposed to herd the horses toward the two men, but I knew the animals wouldn't fall for it. They were faster than us by double and way more nimble, not to mention that neither Joey nor Gordon had ever stuck a bit in a horse's mouth. Lisa and I gave up helping pretty quick. We watched the men chase those horses for the better part of the morning. Gordon was lumbering and slow on his feet. Joey was quicker, but more and more hung over as time wore on. His blood alcohol level must have plummeted sharply at some point, for he abruptly sat down in what turned out to have been a manure pile, so there was a fresh green shit stain on the butt of his tan raincoat. The horses themselves seemed tickled by the whole game. They lo lope hard a while, then when the man men flagged, they'd slow up. The horses led the men the whole length of the field that morning. God knows how many anchor acres. After a while, Lisa and I went back to the car to eat packets of soup crackers from the glove compartment. It was also warmer out of the wind. We played scissor, paper, stone. <laughs> Rock, paper, scissor, but scissors, paper, stone. With our hands the rest of the morning. The winner got to whip the inside of the loser's arm. The tenderest, whitest part, with two fingers. You'd lick your fingers with spit to make the sting worse, then smack them sharp against the skin. By noon, both of our arms had welts all up and down them. The men stood behind the horses far out where the field gave up to rock. The animals started climbing and the men turned back. 
Gordon limping slightly, Joey stopping to hack his convulsive cough every few steps. That's the end of chapter 11. New town, new school, new people at the bar, horses. Right. Chapter 12. Fall slid into winter. There were some light snows, but nothing you could sled in. Mother got a local doctor to order her up diet pills. She zipped them in the inner pocket of her coach bag where she'd always carried baby aspirin before. The bounce, she claimed, that they gave her did stop her from spending whole days laid up drunk in bed. Her empress days, I called them, for she spent them doing nothing more than ministering to herself in small ways. I mean, she'd drink from a bottle of Smirnoff, she'd, she'd made syrupy in the freezer and cut back her cuticles, or she'd smoke while paging through back issues of Vogue, some blues record in the corner, in the corner moaning the whole time about how shitty men were. But those days had never worried Lisa and me over much. If anything, we found comfort in them, for they kept Mother safe in bed. The diet pills took those days from us. They also shot a silver of pissed off into Mother's vo a sliver of pissed off into Mother's voice. Even my asking for lunch money, if it struck her as off the subject somehow, could send her tearing around in search of a misplaced wallet, slamming doors behind her, and lead her to scream at, at the always sleeping form of Hector that he was a lazy son of a bitch. Don't get me wrong, mother didn't go off every time you asked for something, and she always had been prone to temper fits. But on the diet fill pills, a smaller spark could set her off, and the rages could carry her further. When Lisa and I finally figured out to pronounce the magic word on the diet pill label, methamphetamine, we used it in a jump rope rhyme. Methamphetamine, diet pills will make you scream. Methamphetamine, keep you fighting, keep you clean. Oh my god. <gasps> no wonder! Mother did get thinner. She used an ice pack pick an ice pick to poke extra holes in her alligator belt. Plus her tolerance for alcohol, always high, seemed to go up. She drank all day and night without throwing up or passing out. The Yankee accent that had always cued us into how drunk she was turned into her standard manner of talking. Even scarier was the fact that she never slept. I don't mean that she didn't sleep much or slept less, I mean all those months. We never saw her asleep, ever. No matter how late I woke and went scooting downstairs on my pajama butt past the winding sta stair rods, I could find her downstairs drinking, usually alone, with a book on her lap. Oh, it's like tweaking. She read more and more books by guys with more and more unpronounceable names, saying existentialism was the philosophy of despair. Lisa took to hiding what I call those French fried books down deep in the magazine rack, for they got Mother talking in a misty-eyed way about suicide. She would gaze up from the page and say that for some folks, killing yourself was the sanest thing to do. In the rare calm in her voice, those times must have set Lisa fretting about the specter of Mother offing herself. We never spoke that worry out loud, but if Mother lingered too long and too quiet in the bath, Lisa might take up a post outside the locked door, her head cocked, listening with an intensity that always put me in mind of my cousin's hunting dog at a stand of quail. Lisa seemed to hold her breath those times, listening with her whole self for the slightest scuttle to suggest something live. If I went scampering down the hall, humming to myself, ignorant of her worry, she'd wheel my way and press her finger hard against her lips to shush me. Her face twisted into a mask of anger. Speaking a word like suicide out loud was unthinkable. We didn't dare give it a breath for fear of invoking it. In fact, we'd become superstitious enough to stop playing with the Ouija board. After the spirit of Grandma started spelling out how she was broadcasting us to H-E-L-L, -L, Lisa stamped on the planchette till it splintered. I pitched the board into the field of nettles behind our house. We both started any meal off by tossing salt over our shoulders, even, 
even times we hadn't spilled any in the first place. And walking to school, we skipped every sidewalk crack. I kept the fingers on my left hand crossed all the time, while my right hand fingers accounted anything at all. While on my right hand fingers, I counted anything at all. Steps to the refrigerator, seconds on the clock, words in a sentence, to keep my head occupied. The counting felt like something to hang on to, as if finding the right numbers might somehow crack the code on whatever system ran the slippery universe we were moving through. Mother's misery was also sneaking up inside me somehow. One night after Ector passed out, she found me lying wide-eyed in bed next to the lump of quilts that was Lisa. She sat down on the mattress edge and read to me by the hall light from The Myth of Sisyphus, her Bible at the time, by Albert Camus, Camus, whose name she taught me to pronounce right so nobody at any future cocktail party would ever tease me for a hick. Well, I, I don't know how to say it, so... Whoops. Sisyphus, or maybe she's saying how to say it, Sisyphus, I don't know how to pronounce the author's name. Anyway, bottom of 231. Sisyphus had it way worse than all of us, it seemed to me, being doomed to sweat and grunt, pushing a boulder up a mountain all day and night without rest. The punchline was that once he got to the top of the mountain, the rock just rolled back down. So he had to push it up again over and over. This happened forever, Mother said, closing the book. With my head lying deep in the trench of my pillow, I was still waiting for some moral or happy ending, a reward for all that work. I must have said as much, for at some point she tucked a strand of hair behind my ear and told me there was no more point to Sisyphus' task than there was to washing dishes or making beds. You just did those things endlessly till your body wore out. Then you died. The first French sentence I learned might well have come from that book. Il faut souffrir. One must suffer. For some reason, suffering got lined up in my head, not with moral virtue or being good, as it had with the Baptist kids back home, but it, but with being smart. Smart people suffered. Dumb people didn't. Mother had said this back in Texas all the time. We had been. We'd be driving past some guys in blue overalls selling watermelons off their truck bed and grinning like it was a good as was as good a way as any to pass an afternoon. She'd wag her head as if this were the most unbelievable spectacle, saying God to be that blissfully ignorant. Daddy had always counted countered that message, for he took big pleasure in the small comforts, sugar in his coffee, getting the mockingbird in our chinaberry tree to answer his whistle. Without him, mother's misery was seeping in. Happiness was for boneheads. A dumb fog you sank into. Pain, low level and constant, was a vigil you kept. The vigil had something to do with looking out for your own death and with living in some constant state of watchful despair. Middle of 232. Look how long this chapter is. Probably a little too long to get to the end of, but we're still going. Meanwhile, the world was draining itself of color before my eyes. The sky was grayer than ash, clouds close and vague as chalk smudges. Trees lost their leaves. Through the Venetian blinds in our parlor, Lisa and I watched autumn slip into winter like a slideshow. For several days, our neighbors raked their kids jumping into the piles with dogs of various sizes bounding on the edges. It was like something from a Kodak commercial. Then the piles got burned in culverts and trash cans in front of the big colonial houses up all up the block. Wasn't it weird, I said to Lisa in the bath one night, how we thought of trees having leaves, leaves as being normal, when in fact, six months out of the year, there were negative jay, jaybirds. At school, I looked around at the dazed and sleeping kids, my peers, one boy drooling onto graph paper, another folding together a coochie catcher, cootie catcher, excuse me, <laughs> sorry, even the monitor, the principal's daughter, who was supposed to be the smartest kid in class, was at was at that instant blissfully out. Gosh, where am I? Sorry, that 
threw me off. I got the catcher part in there and then it just, okay, my apologies. I looked around, dazing, sleeping kids, my peers, even the monitor. The principal's daughter, who was supposed to be the smartest kid in class, was at that, that instant blissfully outlining her own hand in pencil. They didn't mind being there so much, which I couldn't for the life of me figure, for it was all I could do to tromp through a day without screaming or breaking all my pencils or just kicking somebody hard in the shin. Mother and Ictor went away twice, both times to Mexico, I think. She'd cooked up a scheme to buy a tract of land down there for the purpose of founding an artist colony, some new place for her to paint, though she hadn't had a hit a lick at a canvas since we got to Colorado. The truckload of art supplies she'd ordered sat untouched in the spare room. I was itching to break the seals on the new tubes of oils, dozens of them lined up in the shade of, uh, lined up by shade in a leather briefcase, but knew better. The clean brown palette with the hole for your thumb never got a single bright turban of color squirted on it. The sable brushes of all sizes kept their paper wrappers on. Kept the paper wrappers on. The canvases she bought already strap stretched and primed white sat around the edges of that room like windows on nothing. Lisa and I made up titles for their emptiness emptinesses. Polar bears in a snowstorm and talcum powder on the moon. She never painted in Colorado and they never bought any land in Mexico. They just drank and fought and flew back both bent over double from diarrhea, which daddy had always called the green apple shits. The first time they left us with Ictor's cousin, a girl of about 20, who was cheerfully raising two toddlers by herself on welfare. We called her Purdy. She was small and bird-like, with a tumbling mass of black hair that she tied, tried to tame by rolling it on soup cans at night. And still, it frizzed and seized up in waves around her heart-shaped face. Purdy's kids were easily the world's most miserable toddlers, which she didn't mind one bit, being tickled silly by every blubbering fit one threw. Poor Nanito, she cool when all I could think of was how to smush a pillow across its face to stop its breath altogether. They weren't twins, but have landed in my memory as exact replicas of the same baby, both slobbering mouthed and worried looking. They also had freakishly huge heads that wobbled on their necks and wrapped into the table corners or could pitch them forward off balance from sheer weight. Lisa learned quick how to plug one up with a pacifier or a cold bottle of cold milk. Me, I pouted reading in the corner. The second night we were there, Purdy's roving husband showed up drunk and pounding on the back door. He was raving in a slurry Spanish I could barely make out that he'd come to claim his kids, whom, by the way, I would have been hard-pressed not to part with. But Purdy yanked the soup cans from her hair, so bobby pins scattered all over the dark bedroom with a skittering noise that put me in mind of East Texas roaches scrambling. She shoved Lisa and me under the bed with the babies to keep them quiet. She said he'd kill us all if we made a peep. Lying under that bed, I watched her fuzzy pink scuffs slide her away from us into the strip of light from the kitchen. Quiet was hard for me. I barely played hide and seek without being first found. Plus, the baby I'd been charged with keeping still hardly fit under my arm, being fat and squirmy and smelly through the powder and baby sh shampoo like nothing so much as clambered milk, clabbered milk. There were spider webby threads hanging from the bed springs right in my eyelashes, and the floor through the cloth of my pajama top was a clean slab of ice. Cold. While the voices got louder in the kitchen, the baby got squirmier and noisier. Lisa finally elbowed me in the head to do something, so I clapped my hand over its sloppy mouth. In the course of this, though, my index finger somehow poked between its lips. For a second, I felt a few stubs of tooth in what otherwise seemed like endless slippery curves of gum, the baby's fat tongue writhing like a slug. Something about my finger in that mouth seemed so grotesque that when the baby set to gnawing on my knuckle like a teething ring, I reached down my free hand and pinched it on the thigh, pinched it with all my might, which, amazingly enough, made it fall quiet lying under me. Under the backwash of guilt, I instantly 
felt about having hurt a baby was a deep pleasure at such blatant meanness. The soft flesh giving, b b giving way between my fingers like Play-Doh. No sooner had I done it than I longed to do it again. I didn't dare, of course, for fear the baby would start wailing again instead of just making the lower level sniffle I decided was okay. After what seemed a long time, a tremendous crash came down, came from the kitchen, glass shattering. Footsteps headed down the hall to the front of the house before Purdy broke out screaming, Murder! Murder! Her husband's car peeled from the drive. He'd shoved her face through the back door glass, it turned out. But that scene has melted from my head. We must have rushed in and found her bleeding and screaming, and the babies must have hollered something awful. Something awful. Still, I only keep a picture of Purdy very patiently explaining to the red-faced highway patrol patrolman exactly how her husband had choked her throat, then smacked her face into the glass so she'd heard shattering around her ears and felt the rush of cold air from outside. Her face was all nicked up, and tiny spangles of glass had settled around the flowery yoke of her pink nightgown. The ambulance guy was ringing up a butterfly bandage on a gash that had severed her arched eyebrow into two neat wings. The next time Ictor and mother traveled, we had stayed with his sister Alicia, whom I'd have guessed was too old and fat to fight with her husband Ralph. She wore long gray braids twisted over her head like an opera singer and stood close to the ground being about as wide as she was tall. But sure enough, she was standing at the stove frying tortillas one night and bickering with Ralph about car insurance when he lunged at her. Alicia was quick, though. She hit him square on the forehead with the iron skillet's bottom, and that stopped him in mid-lunge. When he finally swiveled down to the floor, it looked like an af afterthought. At breakfast the next morning, Ralph had a blue knot on the center of his forehead like a goat's horn trying to break through. After that, Last fight at Alicia's house, I flat-pitched a wall-eyed fit over the prospect of being left overnight with anybody, which tantrum killed mother's trips to Mexico. She wore down, staying in antelope, or wait, she wore down, staying in antelope. She even began to pace window to window, the way she had in Texas. I wandered downstairs about three one morning and found mother sitting in her peach silk wrapper at the piano. She twisted pink curls on top of her hair, the slightly longer part, so the sides stuck out and put me in mind of duck feathers. There was a long-stemmed glass of red wine on the piano bench next to her, a Salem burning cool blue smoke from the crystal ashtray. Her ragged copy of Jean-Paul Sartre's Nausea was propped on the piano's music stand. She mixed me some burgundy topped off with 7-Up to help me sleep, she said. She's kidding. Parents are getting kids alcohol. <laughs> she brought it from the kitchen in her fanciest bone china cup. The one with gasoline-like rainbows somehow fired into the white background. It had cherries painted on it, inside and out, and gold on the rim where you put your lips, and even swirls of gold down the handle and around the saucer edge. Mother set the cup next to me on the square resting spot above the keyboard. The 7-Up bubbles rose through the red wine like lava from far away down in the Earth's core. Before that night, I'd had lots of liquor, real champagne even, at somebody's wedding, and I'd cared for it not one whit. Oh, on a hot day with oysters, I liked a taste of Daddy's salted beer, okay? But more than a few sips left me dizzy, and whiskey or scotch, even mixed with Coke, scalded me inside like poison. Also, my parents' drinking was bound up in my head with their screaming cuss fights. Many were the nights in Leechfield when, with the two of them raging behind their bolted bedroom door, I sneaked into the kitchen and gathered up their bottles, whiskey for him, vodka or scotch for her, single malt when she could afford it, dumping those bottles down the sink drain. I always craned my face away, keeping in mind that I was surrounded by poisonous stuff that didn't bother me in the least. Or keep in mind, I was surrounded by poisonous stuff that didn't bother me in the least. From my front porch, you could see an iron refinery tower flaming black smoke into the air. With eyes closed in a moving car, I could tell by the smell alone whether the stink was from the rubber company or the open waste pits of the chemical plant or the clean earth odor of heated crude from the refinery. 
None of those made me pinch my nose, but that brown liquor seemed dangerous, even a breathful. Top of 237. My first sip from Mother's Bone China Cup changed all that. I had heard her tell a hundred times how the monk who discovered champagne had likened it to drinking stars. Suddenly, that made sense. The wine and sparkly soda set my mouth tingling. I thought right off, drinking stars. Whole galaxies could have been taking shape in there, for the taste was vast and particular at once. I had taken too little a sip, though, and had to have another to see if the small, same small explosion happened. It did. I drank down some more. Besides it tasting good, the wine seemed to grow, seemed to go down deep in me, not burning like it had before, but with a slow warmth. A few more sips set that warmth loose and rolling down, down my limbs. I actually felt a light in my arms and legs where the alcohol was spreading. Something like a big sunflower was opening at the very center of my being, which image I must have read in a poem somewhere, for it came to me whole that way. When the cup was empty, I set it down in its saucer with a chime-like clink that told me the world had changed. I looked down at my bare feet dangling out of my nightgown. They seemed far off and pale as a marble statue's, elegant almost. I looked up at Mother. The pink curls with her hair sprung out didn't look goofy anymore or scary like Medusa's snakes. In fact, the closed cap of pinned down hair seemed elegant. The bones of her face suddenly held all their old beauty. beauty. Her forehead was smooth and high, her cheekbones winged out. Her green eyes and pale skin were actually glowing, held in a dim halo. This is, this, it dawned on me, was what people drank liquor for. Even though it could make them puke and slur their words, could bring a man to throw a punch at somebody bound to whip his ass, or cause an otherwise clear-thinking woman to drive fast into a concrete wall. Alcohol could actually make life better, if only by making your head better. I thought of all the fairy stories that talked about magic potions, of Shakespeare's witches from Macbeth about their cauldron bubbling, or with their cauldron bubbling. Later, I lay in bed a long time feeling woozy. If I closed my eyes, I felt the mattress tip sideways like a raft at sea. Only staring steady at something could chase off those whirlies, or at least soften the incline that I felt myself sliding up and down in the waves that I was dreaming in the waves I was dreaming under myself. I fixed on a small por portrait on the far wall. It was a mother's last painting, a guy she called Mac the Knife. She toted it all the way from Texas. That puzzled me since it wasn't even of somebody we knew, being a black-haired Frenchman with almond-shaped eyes. Actually, maybe he wasn't French, but to me, he was the spitting image of the nauseated fellow on the Sartre book cover, the one mother had told me wanted... I'm lost in the sentence. The one mother had told me wanted to puke just from being alive. Mac the Knife wasn't exactly handsome in the technical sense, being sallow, complected, and puny, but it was a good painting. His eyes rested on me easy. The light coming in sideways from the street gave him a sad, knowing look. Plus, he took the whirlies away, merely by being constant in the great roiling of that room. When I said my prayers that night, which I did only after I was sure Mother was back in the parlor, out of hearing range, I directed them as much to that sorry-looking fellow with his sallow cheeks and black turtleneck suspended in a sea of red and black swirls as to any father who might have been installed in heaven. Dear Mac, please keep me from horking on these covers, and keep Mother from finding her car keys in the ivy pot. Amen. Other nights were occupied when Mother and Ector, with Mother and Ector fighting. The litany of his innate low lifedness got seared into my skull during this time. Ector was a pussy, was her main gripe. Also, he lacked gainful employment, which mother accused him of sponging, which meant mother accused him of sponging off her all the time. But if of a hungover morning, he, that doesn't make sense. But if 
of a hungover morning, he lamely started scanning the want ads for bartending jobs, she'd coo up next to him, don't bother, because if he was working, they couldn't make love in the afternoons. Ictor was also the planet's sloppiest drunk. He staggered and slurred and forgot stuff. He fell down and threw up. One morning, I overheard her screaming that, for Christ's sake, he'd wet the bed again. Another time, with Gordon and Joey standing in the kitchen, she'd hollered that Ictor couldn't even get it up that night. Or get it up right. She wrapped the wooden countertop with her knuckles. Pete's dick was always as hard as this. Always. I didn't know how to take this news, but watched Ictor sink down under the weight of it, staring the whole time at the bottom of his lowball glass like it was a crystal ball. For some reason, Mother was just spring-loaded on pissed off, which made her want to harm herself. Once, for instance, when our car was winding home from a particularly nasty dinner in town, Mother just threw open the car door and pitched herself out on the road. Suddenly, the Black Knight was rushing in across the place where Mother had been sitting a few seconds before in a sullen drunk's quiet. The Impala's dome light had flown on, the heavy door bumped and scraped against the snowbank, piled on the road's shoulder with a noise like breaking styrofoam. After a few swerving yards, Ictor finally pulled over and threw the car in park. We watched him stagger away from us along the icy road in his unbuttoned peacoat, disappearing in the dark beyond the red taillight. In a few minutes, he staggered back into view with Mother on his arm. She was wearing a white cashmere coat that night, and the flared bottom was splattered with mud. She was okay, it turned out. She just hit a snowbank and rolled. In fact, they both piled in the car laughing like hell. But I noticed that a scary calm had fallen over Lisa's features. It was a look I'd seen in life snapshots of old soldiers heading back into battle, while the young ones still wore their fear openly, with sweetness. Then the starless night went back to sliding off the car windows again. More nights scrolled past, and days so gray and grainy that not one stands unblurred from any other, till I get sick one day and the grown man who allegedly comes to care for me winds up putting his dick in my eight-year-old mouth. In fact, the whole blank winter sort of gathers around that incident, like a storm cloud getting dense and heavy. It's early afternoon. I've stayed home from school, really sick with a fever. I've been sleeping, and now my forehead is sweaty and cool. There's a headache way back in it. Whoever's supposed to be peeking in on me has left a bowl of Campbell's chicken noodle soup, all peppery the way I like it, on a wicker bed, bed tray. That soup is way cold. I can tell by the globules of oil at the edges. I'm sitting in a shaft of sunlight on the oriental rug in my room, reading Charlotte's Web for the hundredth time. It's the part after the sp spider Charlotte dies, which happens from her ha having woven an egg sack and then filled it full of baby spider eggs. Making those eggs took her last ounce of strength. She knew it would kill her, but she did it anyway. Mother has explained to me how that makes her noble. According to Mr. Camus, uh, Charlotte left the sack in the care of her pal Wilbur, himself a pig. In the weeks since Charlotte, in the weeks since Charlotte last lifted her spiny leg to Wilbur in goodbye salute, in goodbye salute, okay, he has been laying in the mud bawling. He's still bawling when all of a sudden the eggs get ripe enough to hatch. Baby spiders start crawling out of the sack. I mean by the zillions. Their eensy as punctuation marks and scramble out right in front of his blurry eyes. Middle of 240. The fact of them being actually alive makes Wilbur feel better. The way it occurs to me in that shaft of afternoon sun, people talking about the cycles of nature get to feeling better. The way Baptists talking about the Lord's mysterious plan feel better. But no sooner have those spiders said hey to Wilbur to cheer him up than they begin flying away from him on silky little parachutes. They scatter across the sky over the barnyard like so many seeds. They're going to make their web somewhere else. So you think for a minute that Wilbur's going to sink back into his 
porcine misery all over again. Then three of the baby spiders pipe up from the corner of the open doorway over the pen that they've decided to stay with Wilbur, that they want to make their webs right over him, just like their mother did. The story more or less ends there, though the writer, Mr. E.B. White, lets you know that when those three spiders grow up, they're going to lay some eggs too. And you know that this sad-eyed pig will have a steady stream of spider pals, each with the vocabulary of a college professor to edify himself. Sure, they'll die, die after they lay their eggs too, the girl spiders, just like Charlotte did. But the point at the end of the book is that Wilbur will never have to be lonely. I can spend the better part of a day moving between the sad part of this book where Charlotte dies, then paging ahead to read about the three baby spiders wanting to stay with Wilbur. I cry a little, then cheer myself up. Later, I'll learn that that's the structure of an elegy. Lament, consolation, bad news, followed by good news. The sun feels so warm, warm on my bangs, all straight and shiny across my forehead, and the thought of those three baby spiders spinning out the first silk threads to make new webs over the grinning Wilbur laying serpine, supine in his muddy wallows fills me with such light that I want to tell somebody about it. I shout downstairs through the open door for my sitter to come up a minute and get a load of this. When he stands next to me in that circle of sun, I tell him about it with my whole heart, about Charlotte and the babies and Wilbur. I remember so much that I think Daddy would be proud of my telling. My sitter sh nods and s all slow and serious. At the end, he says, how being special friends with somebody keeps you ever from being lonesome and do I want to be his special friend that sets me scampering around the room in search of my big chief tablet the one with the vampire club rituals in it my bare legs are prickly cold under my gr my gown but somebody willing to be a vampire club member is a rare thing I find the tablet and plop back down in my spot of sun to start explaining the initiations but when I look up from the sloping page to see if he's buying it so far, the whole mood of the room has shifted. The zipper of his chinos is level with my eyes, and inside that zipper, his pecker is making that bulge. Bad words for which zoom through my head. Hard on. Boner. Stiffy. I think it is testament to my badness that I even know such words. Once I spent the night with the principal's daughter, and when I asked her if she knew what fuck meant, she said no. When I explained it to her as nice as I could, she broke out crying, though I hadn't even used a single cuss word, sticking instead to those words you find in the encyclopedia under A for anatomy with the sheer glassy pages of muscle and vein and bone me assembling into a man body and a woman body side by side in TV family clothes. Still, the minute I got to the end of telling the principal's daughter about the baby being born, her face just collapsed in on itself in a big pucker. She screamed that her parents would never do that nasty, even trying to have kids. Then, where do you think you came from, dumbass, I said. She ran caterwauling out of the room at that point. A heartbeat later, her mother popped in all grim-faced. She led me by the right by the hand into their dusty foyer where she zipped her parka right over her bathrobe and stepped barefoot into her galoshes. She hoisted me up still in my pajamas with my coat thrown me thrown across me and walked through the cold night back across the street to our house. That was the end of spending the night with the principal's daughter. Maybe grown ups know I know words like hard on from looking at me. You got a smart mouth, little girl, Mrs. Dillard back in Leechfield always sell, said, narrowing her eyes at the pronouncement, and I said that a smart mouth was better than a dumb one any day. Still, sometimes I think being smart just makes certain words go scooting through your head, leaving some bad word vapor that a mean man can pick on. In fact, maybe this man now, who's dragging down his zipper in slow motion, the little brass teeth unlocking before my eyes like the fangs of some sea monster, can hear that word hard on bouncing around inside my head. It invites him almost, draws him to me, actually draws on his dick like magnetism, 
and makes it swell up inside the cloth of his pants. Ugh. It's so awful. Bottom of 242. I think of how the vampire couldn't cross into the girl's window unless she herself took the crucifix off that window and opened it to him saying, come on in. And still people did it, even when they didn't mean to. I hung up those garlic ropes at bedtime. They looped the rosary around the window handles. They went, they full went well meant to shoo that evil away when it came flapping all liquid at the glass. But by the time the vampire actually floated there in the creamy moonlight, the girl in the gauzy nightdress was so awestruck by his hunger, the sheer largeness of it, that she'd unloop all the stuff she'd fixed up to stave him off. The garlic ropes slipped from the brass handles, and the windows swung wide so the curtains billowed over them as he gathered her slender self up into his cape. This whole scene is, is rushing through my head when my babysitter's zipper hits bottom. His hand fishes into that zipper and farther into the shadow of his shorts. The seriousness of that reaching keeps me even from breathing regular. I'm also afraid to make him mad somehow and even more afraid that any move I make or any word I speak will seem like welcome. So I sit still and pretend not to be home inside myself. I worry, 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 though, about what's about to happen. I think of that old neighbor boy laying down on me on the cement sack in the Carter's garage, him on top of me bucking. Probably I don't even have a cherry from that. I didn't hear it pop inside me because I was so busy thinking for him to hurry before I got in trouble. Whether I have a cherry or not, though, I can feel how marked I am inside for being hurt that way. The high school girls always say in the bathroom that you can tell who's been fucked by how she walks. Lisa told me that a, a slew-footed girl, one whose feet splay out, has been getting it for sure. I take comfort in that, for I have the worst pigeon toes in school. Really, back in Leechfield, I got kicked out of the yoga class that Mother wanted me to take at the... Theosophical Society. Here I got kicked out of the Antelope Ballet School. No hip rotation at all, the teacher told Mother, then suggested tap dancing for me. But stumping through a tap routine is for fools. The other girls at the bar mirror looked so graceful. They bent their knees down in plie, their frail arms sweeping as they rose. They moved all together like flowers in some Disney cartoon. I knew in my heart I'd never looked that way. The man's dick springs forward fast to get out of those tight britches. It's red like somebody's mad face, swollen like it hurts. The mere fact of it makes me seize up inside. The man pushes it down a little, holding it at its base so it points right up at my face. I never saw a dick this big, this close. The little pee hole surprises me how it's cut long ways like a vent in a pie. Oh, so gross. This man's not stroking his dick up and down, though, the way that neighbor boy did. He's just holding it gentle, the way you'd show a kid a hamster or something. Still, every now and then, his pecker seems to jump of its own accord, as if it had an idea. Inside the tent of my nightie, I have bucked up my legs and pressed my thigh thighs pressed together hard. I have seemed myself shut down there. Somehow, a small voice rises up from my belly and asks that dick all whispery not to hurt me. This makes the mask of the guy's face smile down at me, the way you'd look down from the cutting board at a dog begging for scraps. He reaches his big hand out to place it on my head, cupping my skull. It's like the gesture Jesus makes in the Bible picture where they've written, Suffer, little children, in the caption. But I won't raise my eyes to see if this man is Jesus, because all the while he's patting my head, that pecker of his is staring right at me with its unslitted, with its slitted eye. From higher, the man's voice very gently says that he wouldn't hurt me for the world, no matter what. He would never, ever hurt me. We're special friends. He loves me. This, he runs his hand up his dick so it shivers to itself, means he loves me. He points his pecker at me again. 
What I wonder is not where to run or how to lunge past him. I know that's impossible. Besides, even if I beat him scrambling downstairs to the phone, what would I say? I have a vocabulary for my own wrongness. All kids do, I think. It's a result of being smaller than, less than, weaker than. No, I can't get out of this by running. Instead, I wonder why somebody doesn't appear in the doorway to lift me out of range of that of that big one-eyed dick staring me down. If God made the world the way Carlita Defoe's catechism teacher said, then why doesn't he send some Christian soldier rushing in with a sword unclanging from its scabbard to stab this man or to lop his pecker off at the root? And I know Carol Sharp would say that this right here is God's plan for me. Or it's punishment for some badness I did. Scaring daddy off, maybe. Or not having the guts to go with him. Or weighing on mother's mind till she couldn't paint a lick and flat lost her mind and set fire to the whole world. The man's voice goes into a scary whisper, more secret-like. It tells how I should put my lips on that dick in a special kiss, which I do. Smooch. And that's not so bad as you might think, if you keep your eyes closed and think of the dick as a little bald man. I should also point out that there is something deeply familiar about hard-on, even when the fundamental feeling coursing through you is that this is wrong wrong, and you are wrong wrong for having been selected for it. Through all that wrongness shines a sense of something you know already, and the fear in your stomach, vampire fear, roller coaster fear, pants pissing fear, has a tickle to it like falling up from up high, the bottom dropping out of yourself. After I kiss his dick, I draw my head back, open my eyes, and see that it's no little bald fellow at all, but really a grown man's swollen outfit. The man's voice floats down to me again, saying, Why don't I poke my tongue out? Try to lick it like a popsicle. And this time, when my face comes closer to it, I draw in a breath and find the pecker itself doesn't really smell bad. Not like a bathroom toilet or anything. Really, it smells like fresh brick baked bread, all yeasty and alive. Oh, gross. There's a tear, or a tear, taking shape in the pee hole, too. This is so hard to read. I'm not going to hurt you, he says. Those words hang there in a cartoon balloon over my head. They are an obvious lie, giving, given the man's voice which has a groan, has grown an ache in itself, a pleading. Just open your mouth a little, baby. I try that. The fleshy head of the pecker parts my lips, easing forward. I open my jaw a little, but am shy of it. My teeth wind up scraping the pecker, so it pulls back with a jerk. Watch your teeth, baby, he says. Then he says that I need to open wide and say, ah, at the same time, try to pull my lips over my teeth. I do my best at this, and must have done okay, for he says, that's it, and yes, before his breath gets ragged. And then for no reason, his hands clap down on the back of my head. All care and gentleness go out of him. I sense that even the voice has gone out of him, which puzzles me, for I'm doing the best I can here. I haven't even cried boo-hoo crying, though tears are streaming down my face. But I'm not making any noise or sobbing or calling out, so these tears seem like somebody else's, the tears of a different girl or a baby doll on TV. The pecker pushes forward and seems to have swollen hard as stone to fill all the space in my mouth. It rams against the back of my throat so I can almost feel it bump deep in my skull where my old dime-sized head headache had up until then almost gone out. At the same time, there's a burning, tearing feeling in my tonsils, like the time I had strep throat. Plus, the fleshy head of that pecker seems to block up my windpipe for the air chokes off. My gag reflex kicks in. All this takes not more than a second. Just when I can't stand it anymore, though, he pulls back, which is a relief. He's still holding my head in the clamp, but for a second, the dick itself backs up from my throat a little so I can suck in a half breath. I stop gagging then. My eyes are watering hard. Surely this is the end of it, I think, for more than this would kill a person. But no sooner than that thought scuttled through my brain than he pushes down on my head again and shoves his pecker forward again, the head of it like some soft mushroom swelling to block off the back of my throat and I gag again. 
Then worst of all, something wet and warm spurts out of the dick itself. He's peeing in my mouth, I'm sure of it. Back in Texas during a scout jamboree, a boy I knew peed in his sleeping brother's mouth, and neither of them, neither one could live it down. But this pee is thick as cream rinse, and not coming in a steady stream, but pumping in slow pulse, and I try to back away from. All the tendons in my neck get tight while I fight to raise my head out of his lap, but his hands hold me down. The dick pushes up. When my throat fills with a salty chemical taste like chlorine from a pool mixed up with salt gargle. Later, when he's all done, he backs way off and gets gentle again. The flat of his hand rubs my back while I'm vomiting down the front gown, the front of my gown. I am grateful for the warm rubbing of his hand, like whatever I did bad, he's forgiven me for. I vomit again till my stomach seizes up on its own hurt, and he's patting on me bent over there. He's saying I'm okay. I did good, though it's clear down in the core of me that I'm no way okay. God, this breaks my heart. That night in bed, I look at the window and wonder about Dracula taking shape on the other side of the heavy drapes waiting to be asked in. I myself shouted down to the babysitter to come up to me. After a long time, I get up and put on my school clothes. I sit dressed on the straight chair in Lisa's room, feet not brushing the floor, sit as still as a statue the way you have, have to when bird hunting or bass fishing with rubber worms. You let the worm drop down to the river bottom and just scoot it through slit through the silt every now and then. Otherwise, quiet for you, don't want to thump around in the boat. When the curtains get light, mother comes in to scrub at the vomit stain on the rug. She has made a little paste with water and baking soda in a cereal bowl and is working that paste into the nap with a tooth toothbrush. She asked me, do I need to stay home again, seeing as how I was earped yesterday. I say, no way. Liz Lisa sits up in her bed, heap of bed covers, blanking. I've got my plaid satchel in my lap. I've matched my bandlock band lawn socks and folded them to the exact right length. I'm immaculately turned out in my school clothes like I've never been before. Really, I say I feel lots better. There's stuff at school I'd rather eat than there's stuff at school I'd rather eat a bug than miss. That's the end of chapter 12. That is heroin. I'm amazed that she's able to write about it. Like, that's just gotta be so hard, so awful, but maybe in some way writing about it helps her work through that traumatic experience. Wow, okay. We're on page 248 with chapter 13 next time.